بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Among the women whom had an impact on the life of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were two of the first women the Prophet actually had his first encounter with. The first one is his mother and her name was Amina bint Wahb bin Abdi Manaf ibn Zahra ibn Kilab ibn Murra ibn Ka'b ibn, ibn Lu'ay ibn Ghalib. And they say that she had only one brother and his name was Yaghuth ibn Wahb. The tribe of Zuhra or Banu Zuhra, they say that we are the maternal uncles of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam because Amina was from them. And we know that the Prophet's father alayhi salatu wasalam, his maternal uncles were from Medina. So the Prophet used to say that my maternal uncles are from Medina. Now, historical resources did not document a lot about the Prophet's mother, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, due to the fact that it was not a time of documentation and no one knew at the time that she would be the mother of the greatest man ever to walk the earth. All what we know about her is that she was a woman of high and prestigious lineage. She was an, a woman of honor and a great family. And this is why most Arabs usually look after. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, a woman is sought after due to her beauty, due to her wealth, due to her lineage, and due to her religious practice. So get the one with the religious commitment or may your hand grab on dust. Meaning that if you choose other than the one with proper religious commitment, then as if you have gained nothing. Therefore, Amina was sought after. We do not know anything about her private life, how beautiful she was, but we know that she comes from a very honorable family. How? did she get to marry Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib? The stories say that Abdul Muttalib had one son, and this son was called Al-Harith. But first of all, who is Abdul Muttalib? We know that our Prophet's name is, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad ibn Abdullah, Ibn Abdul Muttalib, Ibn Hashim. So, what is Abdul Muttalib? And was there a god that the pagans worshipped by the name of Al Muttalib? Actually, Al Muttalib is the name of his uncle. And the father of Abdullah's name was Shaybatul Hamd. Hashim and Al-Muttalib were brothers. And Hashim married a woman in Medina. And she gave birth to Abdullah. Uh, she gave birth to Al-Muttalib. Let me rephrase that. 
So Hashim, the grandfather of Abdullah, who is the father of Prophet ﷺ, got married in Medina. And he had a son by the name of Shaybat al-Hamd. Soon after, Hashim died. So his brother, Al-Muttalib, when Shaybat al-Hamd grew up to be a young man of 14 years of age, traveled from Mecca to Medina to fetch his nephew and bring him back to his country. So when they traveled back to Mecca, when Al-Muttalib and his nephew, who's a 14-year-old boy by the name of Shaybat al-Hamd, entered Mecca, the people of Mecca recognized Al-Muttalib, recognized those who were with him, but did not recognize this boy. So they thought that this boy was a slave which Al-Muttalib bought on his journey. So they called him Abd Al-Muttalib. And Al-Muttalib kept on saying, no, no, this is Shaybat Al-Hamd. He's my nephew. He's not my slave. So the name stuck to him and his name became Abd Al-Muttalib, the slave of Al-Muttalib. So Al-Muttalib now grew up to become a very respected, honorable man of Mecca. He was one of the dignitaries of Mecca and the master of the people of Quraysh, the master of Banu Hashim and Banu Al-Muttalib. Abd Al-Muttalib had a son and he saw in a vision someone coming to him, telling him about Tayba, about Barra, about this, about different names, and then in conclusion, told him to dig up Zamzam. Now we all know the well of Zamzam and the story of Hajar and her son Ismail, peace be upon him, when left long, long time ago, centuries ago in Mecca where there was nothing. And how Jibreel came and dug the well of Zamzam, which kept on giving water to the Muslims ever since. So he saw the location. He got the command in his dream to dig it up. So he went to dig it up and it's close to the Haram, to the Kaaba. So the people started shouting at him, you're insane, what are you doing? And he told them that this is Zamzam. I was told to dig it up. They didn't believe him and they ridiculed him. So he dug it up. Once the water started gushing, people started saying that we have a share in it. He tried to defend it and say, no, this is mine. I was the one who saw the dream and I want, I'm the one who dig it. So I'm the one responsible for it. They would not listen to him. And he had only one son, so he had no protection. So he vowed that if Allah were to give him 10 sons, that he will slaughter one of them as a sacrifice. Soon after, he got married, he got children, and now he has 10 of them. So he has to fulfill his vow. So he drew the lots to know which one to choose from the 10. And it fell on Abdullah, the youngest and the most beloved to his heart. So he did not know what to do. The people advised him to sacrifice 10 camels, but first draw the lots between 10 camels and Abdullah. And the lots came to Abdullah. So they said, add another 10. So he added 10, becoming 20 camels. Again, Abdullah, 30, 50, 90, 100. And then the lots fell on the camels. So he sacrificed 100 camels joyfully and saved his son from being slaughtered. Some say that since then, the blood money for someone who kills someone by mistake or intentionally is 100 camels till date.
And this is in our Islamic Sharia. Ah. Being happy with his son being freed, he went and chose to him one of the best of Quraysh's women. And that was Amina bint Wahab. He was 24 years of age and she was 13 years of age. And this was normal for girls to marry at an early age, as early as nine or 10. He stayed with her for 10 days. Then he left with a caravan to Syria for trade. On their way back, he fell sick, stayed in Medina for a while, only to die and to be buried there. Amina was two months pregnant with our Prophet She heard the news, heartbroken. She lived on the memory of these 10 nights that she had spent with the love of her life. The pregnancy was quite easy and not difficult. Once she gave birth to our Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, she, as many of the women of Quraysh, sent her newborn infant to be suckled at the Badiyah, the Bedouins, who lived on open land in tents so that their bodies would become strong, immune to diseases, and their tongue would be fluent in Arabic, not corrupt due to the different languages. And we will come to the story of how he was given to Halima as saadiyah The Prophet والسلام, as a child used to be brought every year so that they can take the wages of taking care of him and for him to see his mother and to see his grandfather maybe for a month or two and then go back with his family, Halima and his father through suckling. When he was six years of age, the training, if you may say, was over and now he is back with his mother. His mother took him to visit the maternal uncles of his father. They stayed there for a whole month. And on their way back, Amina fell sick and she died. And she was buried at an area called Al Abwa. Now, the Prophet والسلام, did not live long with his mother. And you can say that he did not know her that well when she died at the age of 20. And he was about six to seven years of age. However, we can guarantee, and we are certain, that she gave him love, affection, and care that remained with him 50 years later. In Sahih al-Imam Muslim, the Prophet والسلام, once traveled and passed by the Abwa. And his companions saw him weeping. And they said, O Prophet of Allah, tell us what is happening so that we can weep and join you as well. He said, I requested my Lord to seek forgiveness for my mother and he denied me. So I wept. And we know that the Prophet was denied because the Muslims are not permitted to seek forgiveness 
for someone who died as a non-Muslim. And we, as Muslims, would pay anything we possess. We would sacrifice our own parents and loved ones just for the mother of the Prophet ﷺ to be accepted as a Muslim. But this is not something that we feel and hope for because it's the decree of Allah Azza wa Jal. And no one can be more merciful than Allah the Almighty. And this is religion. Yes, we would have loved that the Prophet's mother would be admitted to paradise and that he would be granted the permission to seek forgiveness for her. But it's not in our hands. This is Allah's law. This is the authentic hadith in Sahih al-Imam Muslim. Then the Prophet said, alayhi salatu salam, I sought permission from Allah to visit her grave and Allah gave me permission to do so. You can tell by the amount of sorrow in the Prophet's heart والسلام, that made him weep and cry over a mother he had not seen or been with except for few months. Yet the amount of love she gave her son still resonated with him even after five or six decades down the line. This is how men feel about their mothers, how strong emotions they have towards their mothers. And this is how Islam honored the mothers. Now, the other woman is Harima. And it's an issue of dispute whether she accepted Islam later on or not. And inshallah, she is a Muslim and among the companions, Halima bint Abi Dhu'ayb. And her father, Abu Dhu'ayb's name is Abdullah ibn al-Harith. She tells us about how she got the Prophet والسلام, and was honored to be his mother through suckling. She said, we came to Mecca as we do every year, pitching for a newborn that needed to be suckled and raised in the outskirts where the grazing land is, where all the herds are. This is the habit of the people of Mecca. So we all went. I, she saw, talks about it herself, had a son and he never let us sleep because I could not give him any milk because we were in drought and famine. We went to Mecca on my mule and we had a camel which had no milk in her to feed us at all. When we came to Mecca, we came late because of how tired the mule and the camel were. So everybody went ahead of us and every woman from my tribe, that they showed her the Prophet Muhammad, they asked, where is his father? When they were told that he was an orphan, they rejected him. What would we do with an orphan when we want money from his father and his father is not alive? When she arrived late, there was no other child to take. So she took the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, so that no one would say that she came back empty-handed. That night, the moment she received the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, her breasts were filled with milk. The Prophet drank and had his full. His brother drank and had his full and went to sleep. The first night they had slept in months. Not only that, even the camel, the she-camel, her husband went and milked it and they all had their meal to the full. And he told his wife, this boy is a blessed soul. Take good care of him. 
he went and he was raised there in the open ground, in the grazing grounds, playing with the children, nothing so special but things that made people suspicious. Once Halima went to look for her son, Muhammad, and he was not around. And it was so hot that the herds and the camels were on the ground resting. After some distance, she found him with his sister. And she said to his elder sister, what are you doing in the middle of the day under the hot sun? She said, mother, I didn't do anything. He kept on walking and there was this cloud on top of him. Wherever he stood, it stood. And wherever he moved, it moved, shading him. And then she tells us about the miraculous surgery that the Prophet had on the hands of Jibreel and Israfil. Peace be upon them. Just when he was five or so years of age, two men came and they made him lie on his back, opening his chest to his belly button and extracting his guts and washing it in a bowl of gold with zamzam water, then extracting his heart and taking something black out of it, then replacing everything back and stitching it all as it was. Halima and her husband were terrified when they came to the rescue and found the boy there a little bit pale. And they asked him, he told them what had happened. So they took him back to his mother and his mother told them that this is nothing. I know my son will grow to be something else because I saw in my vision this and that. And she comforted them. They took him back and then when the period or the training was over, they brought him back to his mother only to lose his mother when he was again six years of age to be taken care of by his, by his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, until he was eight years of age, then to die, his, gra his grandfather's death was also one of the tragedies that the Prophet ﷺ had undergone, only to be taken care of by his uncle, Abu Talib, and we all know what happened afterwards. Two great women who took care of our Prophet ﷺ, who had a print on his life, an impact on his upbringing to women around the Prophet alayhi salatu wassalam. Hada wallahu a'lam wa nisbatu al-ilmi ilayhi aslam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today I'm going to talk about the book Interactions of the Greatest Leader. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught them what to say when stricken with a calamity. Allah says, what means? And we will surely test you with something of fear and hunger and a loss of wealth and lives and fruits. But give good tidings to the patient who when disaster strikes them say indeed we belong to Allah and indeed to him we will return those are the ones upon whom are blessings from their Lord and mercy and it is those who are the rightly guided Um Salama may Allah be pleased with her said I heard the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say there is not a Muslim that is afflicted with a calamity who says what Allah ordered him, what Allah ordered them to say. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Allahumma ajurni fi musibati wa khlufli khayran minha. To Allah we belong and unto him we shall return. O Allah, 
Grant me reward in my calamity and give me something better in return. Except that Allah will give him something better in return. Um Salama, may Allah be pleased with her, continued. When Abu Salama died, I said, which Muslim is better than Abu Salama? The first household to migrate to the Messenger of Allah. Then I said, that supplication. And Allah the Almighty gave me the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in return. Reported by Muslim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A sister says, is the reward for women praying taraweeh at home more than men or women who go and pray in the masjid behind an imam, the reward of praying the whole night because of the hadith of the Prophet والسلام, who said that the prayer of a woman is better than or the be better at her home, better than even praying in my masjid. Now, this issue seems to cause a lot of confusion among, among women. First of all, we have a reward that was given to whomever prays in the masjid behind the imam until he's over during taraweeh of Ramadan. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, إِنَّهُ مَنْ قَامَ مَعَ الْإِمَامِ حَتَّى ينصرف. He who stands in prayer with the Imam until he concludes, meaning praying witr and giving salam, until he concludes his prayer, then Allah would grant him as if he prayed the whole night. So now, we lazy men think of it in terms of calculation. One plus one equals two. If I pray behind the Imam for 30 or 40 minutes, 11 rak'ahs of taraweeh, then Allah would reward me as if I prayed from Isha till Fajr. That's one heck of an investment. So we usually opt for it. Now, this is for men and women. However, women are caught between a rock and a hard place. So the sister comes to me and says, Sheikh, I want ajr, I want reward. And if I go to the masjid, I'll be rewarded as if I prayed the full night. But my confusion is that the Prophet والسلام, said that a woman's prayer in her home is better than her prayer in my masjid. Which we know that one prayer in the Masjid of, of, the, of the Prophet Islam, it is equivalent or is better than 1,000 prayers, prayers elsewhere. So now, come on, how to do the math? First of all, do you believe that your prayer in your home is better than the prayer in the Masjid of the Prophet Islam? She says, yes. So I said to her, okay, then what do you want? She said, Sheikh, if I pray home, I have to pray at least three or four hours to compensate for the full night which I missed in the masjid. And I say, okay, why don't you pray in the masjid? She said, because the Prophet said it's better to pray home. Well, this is something in Allah's hands. What I feel and I know is that if you pray in the masjid, this is totally permissible and legit. It was the Prophet himself والسلام, who said, do not prevent women from attending salat in the masjid. He is the one who said that. Not only that, his own wives used to pray in the masjid. Whether it was Sauda, whether it was Aisha, whether it was Zainab, they all used to pray in the masjid with the Prophet والسلام, and the Prophet had never told them, don't pray in the masjid, pray at your homes. He just told them what is best. Pray at homes. If you don't want to, it's okay. So what do you say, Sheikh? I say that if a woman is so eager for 
having this reward. And at the same time, she complains that she doesn't have enough time during the night. She has to care for her family, for her husband. She has to do the chores. She has to cook. She has to work if she is working in da'wah, etc. And all of this consumes a lot of her time. And if she wanted to pray three or four hours just to get great reward from Allah Azza wa Jal, the night is not enough. While praying one hour in the masjid would compensate for all of that. I would say it's up to her, let her go to the masjid. But if a woman does not have anything to do and she's staying home without any obligations or commitment, in this case, I would say to her, pray home. And the longer you do, the, the greater of reward Allah will grant you as long as you anticipate the reward of not praying in the masjid with the congregation. Allah Azza wa knows best. Ali says, is it from the sunnah to ask for forgiveness from everyone before the holy month of Ramadan commences? This is a common misconception. So before Ramadan begins, everybody texts me, if I had done anything wrong, please forgive me and let there be no grudge or hatred towards me in your heart. May Allah accept Ramadan from us all. They also do this before they go for Umrah or Hajj. They keep on calling people, ask them for forgiveness. And all of this is not from the Sunnah. This is an innovation to think that this is connected to Ramadan or to Umrah or Hajj. This is an innovation. Yes, you've done something wrong to someone, ask them for forgiveness, but not to connect it with Ramadan or to Umrah and Hajj. Mumina says, is it permissible to take a shower on the first day of Ramadan? Because in my country, many people do this as, it's, as if it's part of welcoming Ramadan. Taking a shower every day or twice a day is good. It's refreshing. It's keeping your body clean and fresh. It prevents your odor from harming others if you have one. But connecting it to the first night of Ramadan and thinking that it's part of the rituals of Ramadan, this makes it an innovation. Because this was not done by the Prophet ﷺ, nor recommended. Yes, if you take a shower every single day, whether it's Ramadan or not, there's no problem in that. But thinking that I have to offer a ghusl for Ramadan, this is prohibited and an innovation. Muhammad says, what is the difference between giving sujood, just sahu, before salam and after salam? Can you please explain in detail? First of all, this is the first time someone says, this is the first time I know that you can offer sujood al-sahu after salam. This is new for me. Well, every day we, knew, we learn something new. The hadith that governs sujood al-sahu are many. Abdullah ibn Buhayna, may Allah be pleased with him, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, Abu Huraira, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with them all. They all narrated this. And different scenarios. And in a nutshell, because we can't go into details. First of all, you have to understand that sujood as-sahu is offered when you make a mistake in a pillar or a mandatory act in salat. This means that any voluntary act you make a mistake or you leave it intentionally or you add it intentionally does not impact your salat to the extent that you have to offer sujood as-sahu. So someone does not raise his hand. So in the beginning, I start my salat by saying, Allahu Akbar, 
I didn't raise my hands. My prayer is valid because raising the hands is a sunnah. But if I did not say Allahu Akbar, this is a pillar. My prayer is not conducted yet. I haven't started yet. I can't start a prayer without saying Allahu Akbar. So it has to be a mistake in a pillar or in a mandatory act, which means that you have to learn what are the pillars of Salat and what are the mandatory acts of Salat to know how to do, how to act, and how to behave. Secondly, scholars say that there are two locations where we pray or offer two prostrations of forgetfulness before salam and another two locations or incidents or reasons for offering it after salam. So the first one is when you drop a mandatory act, when you forget a mandatory act. So let's assume that I am praying dhuhr for rak'ahs. In the second rak'ah, I do not sit for tashahud. I stand up for the third rak'ah. And I, after I'm fully standing, someone says, Subhana Allah, Subhanallah, bringing my attention that I have not sit for the third rak'ah, for the uh, first tashahud. What to do? I have to continue my prayer. I skipped the first tashahud. Yes, but this is mandatory, and I skipped it out of forgetfulness. Continue my prayer as normal. After the salutation, before concluding my prayer, I offer Allahu Akbar to sujood al-sahu, saying subhan rabbi al-ala as normal. And then, assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah, assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah, that's it. Assuming that I'm in rukur, and instead of saying Subhan Rabbi al azim I made a mistake and I started saying Subhan Rabbi al-Ala, Subhan Rabbi al-Ala, Subhan Rabbi al-Ala, Sami Allahu liman hamida. And then it came to my mind that what did I do? I missed saying Subhan Rabbi al azim I have to offer sujood al-sahu before salam because I've dropped something that is mandatory. Now, if I added something to the salat, so, for example, I stood for the fifth rak'ah and then realized that this is, this is the fifth. I immediately sit down. I cannot complete anything. I have to sit down because this is a void rak'ah. If I added a third sajda, then I remember that this is the third. I stand up immediately or sit down depending on my position. But I had already added something. What should I do? Continue my prayer as usual. After the salutation is over and the dua, I say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Allahu Akbar. I offer two prostrations after the salam. So these are two locations one before, one after. Kapish, inshallah, understood. Now we come to the third case or the third situation. And this is when I am confused. I'm in the middle of the prayer and I'm totally unaware of whether this is the third rak'ah or the fourth rak'ah. So my confusion is in the fourth rak'ah. My confusion is, did I prostrate one prostration or this is my second prostration? So whenever there's a confusion, and I'm, I'm totally lost. I'm not aware. I don't know. Is it my second rak'ah? Is it my third rak'ah? Is it my fourth rak'ah? I'm not aware. There is doubt. The, the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, when some of you prays and he's doubtful whether he prayed three or four, he should base his assumption on what is confirmed. So now, I'm doubtful whether I prayed three or four. Where is the doubt? Definitely it's in four, because three, I'm certain that I prayed them. My doubt is in the fourth. So the Prophet says, base your assumption on what is confirmed. So I neglect that I've prayed four, and I consider myself have prayed three, and continue accordingly. And just before salam, I offer to sujood of sahu, 
then offer salam. So when there is no balance, no determination whether this or that, it's totally equal. In this case, I base my assumption on the least number. I'm in sujood. Is this my first or my second sujood? Well, I don't know. Then I would assume that this is my first sajda because this is the confirmed. And I get and do the second sajda and also perform sujood the sahu before the salam. This is case number three. Case number four is the same. When I'm confused, whether I prayed three rakahs or four rakahs, whether this was my first sujood or second sujood, but the difference is that I am inclined to one of the two. I'm not totally blinded by confusion, not knowing three or four, no. I'm inclined that, yeah, yeah, this is most likely the third, because in the third uh, uh, rak'ah, I usually recite, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدَ after Fatiha, and I just remembered that I did that. Or I would say, no, most likely this is the fourth, because I did this or I did that, or I heard a sound or I heard an ayah. So you have a reason to be inclined to one of either you added or deleted or omitted, either this or that. You have a reason to be inclined to either one. In this case, after salam, you offer two sujood of sahu. To recap, before salam, you offer sujood of sahu in two cases. One, either you omitted something from your mandatory acts, to compensate that, you offer two sujood before salam. Or you are confused whether you did this or that and you cannot be inclined to any of them. You base your assumption on the least, the number that is the least, and continue your salat and offer two sujood sahu before salam. You perform it after salam when you have added something that is not part of the salah, a third tashahud a fifth rak'ah, uh, something mandatory in other than its place, then you offer two sujood after salam. Or, and this is the fourth, when you are confused but you're inclined to whether you added or omitted something from the salat, you act upon that and you offer your sujood after the salam. When we say after the salam, do we offer also another tashahud? The answer is no. You simply offer salam, then immediately two prostrations, saying Subhana Rabbi al-A'la, Allahu Akbar, Assalamu Alaikum wa Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah. So I hope this answers your question. Munir says, the crescent moon and the star, which some people consider to be the Islamic symbol, does it actually have any basis in Islam? The short answer is no. It has no trace or relationship or roots in Islam. Some people came up with it to match the, David, uh, the Star of David, to match the cross which the Christians have. And the Muslims at that era said, we don't have anything to show as a symbol. So they came up with the crescent and they came up with the star, and this has nothing to do with Islam. So relating it to Islam, considering it to be part of Islam, hanging it on mandrets or hanging it on flags, this has nothing to do with Islam. Shamim says, if quarantine period lasts the whole of Ramadan, what will be or what will we do with our Eid prayer? Is it obligatory on everyone during this time? And can we pray at home? And how must we pray it with a khutbah or without giving a khutbah? First of all, the issue of praying Eid prayer alone or when missed in the musalla is an issue of dispute. The majority of scholars, the school of Maliki, the school of Shafi'i, the school of Ahmad ibn Hanbal, they say that you can pray it if you missed it. So those home can pray it without a khutbah. 
with seven takbir in the first, five takbir in the second rak'ah, the normal rak'ah. And this is the opinion of the majority of schools of thought. However, the school of thought of Al-Imam Abu Hanifa, they say that this is not permissible. This salat was made to be prayed in congregation in an open area, in an open plaza, and not even in the masjid, let alone in the homes. So it is not permissible to be prayed at homes. If you missed it with the congregation, with the Muslims, do not pray it as it's not permissible. And this opinion was adopted by Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. And also a Shaykh Muhammad ibn Salih al uthaymin may Allah have mercy on their souls, all of them. And I'm inclined to this opinion that it is not permissible to be prayed individually at homes. And inshallah, we pray and hope that Allah by then would have uplifted this calamity and this crisis from all the world. Sonia says, how do I deal with my husband who doesn't want me to wear hijab? Be diplomatic, be respectful, but hold your grounds and remain steadfast. Hijab is not a personal choice. It is an obligation from Allah that was mentioned in the Quran and in the Prophet's Sunnah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. No one has the right to oppose it, and there is no obedience to anyone in disobeying Allah, the Almighty. Aliza says, is it authentic to recite Surah al sajdah before sleeping? And what is its reward? We do not know what the reward is, but we certainly know that the Prophet ﷺ used to recite Surah al sajdah as well as Surah Al-Mulk before he went to sleep. Isha says, I accidentally dropped the Quran. What is the hidayah or the hadiyah I have to give now? So Isha most likely is asking about the expiation for a person who had dropped the Mus'haf, the Qur'an. So a person is holding the Qur'an, reading it, and he drops it. Is there any expiation for that? The answer is no. It's a mistake. And so many people have seen them. They hold the Qur'an, they, they kiss it. And some people go to an extra mile when they offer sujood, and they call it the minor sajda. So they kiss it, and they prostrate on it. What is this? He said, no, this is a sign of respect. No, akhi, this is a clear innovation. No one had ever said that prostrating on the Quran is a sign of respect. So if you drop the Quran, there's nothing for you to do except to be more careful. Abdul Hamid says, there are 30 different books that contains 30 juz of the Quran. So there's juz amma, juz tabarak, etc. These books do not contain anything except the verses of the Quran. Must, must we treat and respect these books as Quran? Of course, you have to, it's not a choice. You must respect these chapters because this is part of the Quran. The second question is, do we have to be in wudu? The answer is most likely, Yes, just to be safe rather than sorry, though the, it is not the full Quran, but it still is considered part of it. Suhail says, what is the ruling on short selling in stock market? Is it permissible? This is a long issue. First of all, the stocks that you buy must be halal stocks. And they must not finance their projects in riba like most of the companies now. Whenever they have a project, they finance it through banks, through riba. And this is prohi prohibited for you to buy because you're a partner then. When you give, get a share, you become a partner. And they're dealing with riba and you're dealing with riba. Secondly, short 
uh, uh, selling is actually not buying you. It, it, this is gambling. You do not buy the stocks with your own money. Then I would have no problem. Because if you buy it, it's yours. If the prices went down, you're not forced to sell it. If the prices go up, you're not forced to sell it, but most people would sell it. Short selling is borrowing someone else's stocks and hoping to sell it at the end of the day and make a profit, hoping that the prices would go down. So you would be making profit or goes up, but you will be in deep trouble if you buy the stocks and five or 10 minutes later, the price goes 800% or 700%. How are you going to repay this? This is clear gambling and it's totally prohibited and uh, uh, not allowed. I'm afraid that this is all the time we have for tonight's episode. Until we meet tomorrow night, same time, I leave you fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.